Amen. So this morning, we're going to continue our study of the Ten Commandments as we look at the Ninth Commandment, which is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. Now I'm sorry, I wrote the wrong one down, but it's verse 16. 15 was last week, or two weeks ago. Anyway, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, as uh, we dig into this commandment, here's a question right off the top for you. Why would God give this command? Why would God tell us this? Well, like all the commandments, this commandment has its root in God's character. God is holy, he's righteous, he's just, he's pure and good. God cannot lie. He is incapable of lying. He is a God of truth and grace. And truth has its origin in God and lies have their origin in Satan. Satan is a liar, Jesus said, and has been from the beginning. He is a liar and the father of all lies, Jesus said. In fact, Jesus said that Satan uses lies to kill, to steal, and destroy people. And if he can keep people from knowing and believing the truth, and instead, believe what is untrue and what is therefore a lie, he will, keep, he will kill people by leading them into sin and error. So the consequence for sin, it's wages, as you know, if you're familiar with your Bible, the wages of sin is death. So for those who believe Satan's lies and do not repent and trust in Christ as their Savior and Lord, the wages of sin is death. Now, we live in a day where there are lies everywhere. Would you not agree with that? I mean, all over the place. The media lies, the government lies, commercials deceive, people lie on social media, people lie to themselves. And some churches lie by not preaching and teaching what the Bible actually says. The Muslim holy book, the Quran, encourages Muslims even to lie, to make converts. And there are other examples that I can give as far as lying, and I will later on. But suffice it to say, it is the nature of sinners to lie. It is not the nature of Christians to lie. Well, pastor, are you saying that Christians are sinless? No, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that Christians sin less the longer they're saved, right? We're not sinless, but we sin less the longer we're a Christian. The Holy Spirit of Christ who comes in the moment we're saved and dwells within us, sanctifies us and makes us holy as he conforms us into the image of Christ. And this occurs in different people at different rates and speeds. And it differs and varies from person to person, but it does happen. You can't stay the way you are uh, like prior to salvation and think that you're saved after Christ comes in your life. You won't stay the way you are. He won't let you stay the way you are. That's why we call salvation conversion. 
Conversion means to change something, to convert it over to something that it was not, something different. In other words, you're not what you once were. Old things have passed away, the Bible says. Behold, new things have come. Your desire, as you grow as a Christian, your desire for the things of this world decreases and your desire for the things of God increases. Conversion is what you might call a 180. It's your head in this direction before you're saved and then now that Christ comes into your life and gets hold of your heart and changes you, you do a 180 and you start marching the way God would have you live. It's a, it, it's, it is progressive in time. In other words, the moment you're saved, you're not automatically perfect for the rest of your life. It's progressive in time. Sanctification is a process that occurs in you through time. But from God's perspective, God looks at us through Christ and he sees us as perfectly holy, perfectly righteous, not because of anything we've done or anything in and of ourselves, but because of Christ's righteousness within us. It takes time for us to see progress in holiness on this side of heaven, but in Christ, we're already holy. The Bible says that he, Jesus, is our sanctification. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't stand lying. I don't like it. I love truth, and I hate deception. And we live in a day when everyone does what is right in his own eyes. Just like back in the book of Judges. It's been the, that way throughout the centuries. And it's no more different than it is today. Today is just the same. People think that they can determine what truth is for them. That it is relative. But there is no my truth. Maybe you've heard people say that before. There is only God's truth. People often make claims that are self-defeating. So think about the claim someone might make. Maybe you've even heard this before. All truth is relative. Well, that statement cannot be true if all truth is relative because if all truth is relative, that very statement is relative. And so it's not true. Now, I don't know if you're tracking with me on that, but how, when we come to this ninth commandment about not bearing false witness against your neighbor, how should we think about that? How, if we're thinking about truth, if we're thinking about falsehood. How do we think about this ninth commandment of not bearing false witness against your neighbor? Because when you first read that on the surface, this commandment seems like it's simply saying, don't say that your neighbor did something that he did not do. Or don't say your neighbor did not do something that he did. That's the false witness, bearing false witness against your neighbor. In other words, don't lie about your neighbor to cause him harm or injury for your own benefit. So that is certainly one application of this. And maybe even you're asking the question, well, who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus was asked the very same question by someone back in his day. And in Luke chapter 10, where you find the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus taught that our neighbor is anyone around us, regardless of their ethnic, religious, or socioeconomic status. Those, that's our neighbor. Basically, everyone is our neighbor. So think with me about this. Peter, the apostle, the disciple, Peter lied to his neighbors when he was hanging out by the fire outside the court where Jesus was being questioned. Peter was asked three times whether he was a follower of Jesus, and he denied it three times. He lied three times. 
In the book of Acts, Ananias, that's a third Ananias, by the way, y'all who are in my class, different one, Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, lied about the price of some land that they sold. And they were deceptive. And Peter questioned Ananias by saying, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? It's interesting. First he says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? And then he says, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all who heard these things. A very similar thing happened to his wife, Sapphira. She lied and she too died. So listen, God is serious about the truth. Truth heals and lies destroy. You can't build a church or a nation upon lies. Ephesians 4.25 says, Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. So we must be honest and truthful with each other or we cannot have a functioning society. And if we're not honest and truthful with each other in the church, we can't have a functioning church. Because Paul here in this verse says, we are all members of one another, whether it's in the church or whether it's in the community. We all have an effect on each other. Lies divide, deceive, and destroy. No one should have to be put under oath to tell the truth. You ought to just tell the truth automatically, all the time. The Bible says that our yes should be yes and our no should be no. We shouldn't even have to swear by anything to tell the truth. We should just tell the truth. And please also understand that there is no such thing as a white lie. You ever heard that term? Oh, it's just a little old white lie. A lie is a lie is a lie no matter the circumstances. I'm just telling you. And there's something too about telling a lie. Once you tell a lie, you have to keep telling lies to cover them up. It just keeps going. So what are some ways that people lie? Well, I'm going to name a few. Uh, perjury. Lying under oath, bearing false witness, perjury, that's lying. Slander, spreading lies to destroy the reputation of another, that's lying. Gossip, spreading unsubstantiated rumors about another person for your pleasure and not for their good. So, gossip, exaggeration, making great claims that are not true, making something out to be bigger or better than it is. Y'all ever heard of a fish tail? Somebody catches a fish about this big and next thing you know, 10 years later, it was this big, you know. Anyway. Um, misrepresentation can be a lie. Being dishonest about the condition, the stipulations, or the nature of something. When it comes to people, this could include something like a deep fake. Have you ever heard of a deep fake? If you haven't, you're going to. Because particularly in this upcoming election cycle, people are going to be saying that this guy said this 
and here it is. And you'll have a picture of someone who looks like whoever. And it sounds like they're actually saying what they're saying. So either the, the picture of them could be fake, even though it looks just like them, or the video or the, the, I mean, the audio of them saying it could be fake, even though it sounds just like them, or both. And this is all possible by all this artificial intelligence that's growing and expanding in our country nowadays. So a deep fake, I mean, somebody could take, have your picture and somehow with the wonders of technology could, could just make it come alive and make it look like you're saying something that you never said. It's scary, this kind of stuff. Or another way you can misrepresent is maybe taking part of a sermon out of context or taking anything someone says out of context to make them appear to say something they did not say uh, or to be something or making it appear that there's something they're not or that they believe something that they don't believe. So that's misrepresentation. Here's another form of lying, and that is insinuation. <laughs> to hint or suggest something to cause someone to think poorly of somebody. To hint or suggest something to cause someone to think poorly of somebody. That's insinuation. And then there's equivocation. The use of ambiguous language to conceal the truth or misleading words. Um, now, I've got more, but at this point, I want to show you a video. Some of you probably have already seen it. If you watch CBS morning show, it was on there. It's a video about supposedly what happened in New Orleans this past week during the Southern Baptist Convention. So if I'm gonna to try to play it up here so you can hear it, and if I'm able, I'm gonna to try to pause it every time they tell you something that's not true. So I wish I could have paused it along the way, but um, the issue, well, there's a lot of deception in, in that story. Um, the issue that only men should lead, that's not, in general, that is only concerning pastors. Number two, the Southern Baptists did not kick them out technically. They left us by, by taking those stances, all right? Um, there were some other things. When, when the pastor, Linda, um, was interviewed, she said that says that by the stance we took, that says women are not valued that's not correct. We passed a resolution this year at the convention about overwhelming support for women in ministry, women serving in and through the church. That women are not called, just women are called as much as men. The thing is though, is that that particular office is limited to men by scripture. And then the, what she said is that we don't want you. That's totally untrue. We love our women. We, we need our women. In fact, if we didn't have the women, a lot of our churches wouldn't even be open. I mean, you look around and you see who's mostly sitting out there today. You look around and you see who does most of the work today in the churches. It's the women. We couldn't do anything without them. Then they talked about abuse, that there are uh, thousands, that hundreds of cases of abuse have been hushed, that there are allegations of that. That's, if there's allegations, that's all it is, it's allegations. Um, then there's uh, about the SBC membership being decreased. Well, it probably did. In fact, we're reporting about 13 million Southern Baptists 
across the U.S. Um, the truth is, on the average Sunday morning in, a, in Southern Baptist churches, you might get about four million people showing up for church. So more truthfully, we probably have four to five million actual people who are involved and active in Southern Baptist churches than the 13 million we actually report. So anyway, those are just some things that was to me a misleading one-sided report that makes the Southern Baptists out to look like Neanderthals or something that we're not. But I'm, the, just an example of lies. Not all of it was, but there was enough in it to, to make you think that way. So as we think about this commandment, um, another angle to this is not telling the truth when you should, when it's the right thing to do. In other words, if you need to speak up, speak the truth. Uh, dis disparagement is another way you can lie. To denigrate, defame, or belittle someone in order to destroy them personally, politically, financially, and in other ways. And then here's one it's, you see in the Bible sometimes, being double-tongued. You ever heard of that, being double-tongued? Saying one thing to one person and something different to another that results in at least a lie to one of them. That's being double-tongued. And then, the last one I'm gonna bring up is perversion of meaning. Perversion of meaning. This is when you deconstruct language and meaning in order to reconstruct new language and new meaning. For example, if I say something like, abortion is health care. This takes an action that is murderous to a pre-born person and redefines it as health care for women. This is a perversion of meaning. If, I, if I'm told to stop using the word woman and use the words persons with the capacity to become pregnant, this is a perversion of meaning. Similarly, if I am told to stop using the words pregnant woman and use the words pregnant person, this is a perversion of meaning. If I'm expected to say no man in the place of woman, that is a perversion of meaning. If I'm told to refer to someone as they instead of he or him or she or her, this is a perversion of meaning. If I'm told to refer to she as a man who thinks he's a woman, that is a perversion of meaning. It goes against reality and it's a lie. Similarly, if I'm told to refer to as he, a woman who thinks she's a man, that too is a perversion of meaning and goes against reality and is a lie. If I'm told that I hate people because I tell them the truth about life and death and heaven and hell, sin, judgment, Jesus, the gospel, his love, his grace, and his mercy, if that's hating people, that is a perversion of meaning. I actually love people enough to risk being given the label of being a hater or them claiming I'm attacking them. Folks, they're just believing lies from the devil. We live in an upside down world. You need to read Isaiah chapter five where the Lord says things like, woe to those who call good evil and evil good. Isaiah five rightly describes the days in which we live. So let me conclude this morning with some reminders from scripture. From James 1 26, the Bible says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. James 3, 2 through 6. For we all stumble in many things, right? We do, don't we? If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, all able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths so they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships, all the Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. 
Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest fire, a forest, a little fire kindles, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. And then 1 Peter 3, starting in verse 8. Finally, all of you, be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers, be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. And do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled, but sanctify the Lord your God the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear, having a good conscience that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. For it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And then the last verse I would share with you this morning is Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, where it says, But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Now listen, God's people are people who love the truth. They learn it, they love it, they share it, they say it, they believe it, they write it, and they live it. Not always perfectly, but we do strive to that end. We want to. And if you're here today, whether you're in person or online watching later by video, and God has spoken to you about lying and deception, that you're guilty of breaking this commandment, I want to tell you there is hope for you. God gave us these to warn us and to drive us to seek salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. So if you're feeling guilty, that's good. That's a good sign. You should not despise it. It's like the pain you feel when something is wrong with your body. It's a good thing that your body has pain indicators to let you know something's wrong. God made us that way so that we would seek out help, seek a physician and seek healing. So the conviction you feel today is God's attempt to motivate you to surrender yourself to his love, to his grace, his forgiveness, and his ways. Listen, understand, God is for you. God is the best ally you could ever have. The devil wants you to think that living God's way is a burden and a bore. It's not. Being a Christian is the adventure of a lifetime. It's the adventure of eternity. So if you feel the Lord's conviction of sin, it is a good thing. He stands ready and willing to forgive and change everyone who will come to him for salvation. So call upon the name of the Lord today as the Bible tells us to. Because Jesus went to the cross, he shed his blood for your sins and he rose from the dead on the third day. Look unto Jesus and be saved. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for its clarity. And Lord, it's very convicting in places. And Lord, forgive us, Lord, where we sin against you. And Lord, may we repent and live obedient lives for you. And Lord, if there's anyone here today who needs to trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, we pray that maybe 
that today would be the day that they call upon your name and be saved. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we sing this final hymn,